Colorado area and really visit some of the most beautiful landscape. We saw those amazing red rocks and, and some beautiful mountain lakes and, and the mountains, man, some of the most vast and, and grand, grand mountains you would, you would ever see in, in, in the world. And, and, you know, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. I was talking to Gary out in the coffee bar, and I didn't have to say much. He knew what I was talking about because he had been there. But when we were at Bear Lake, and that's the picture here in the Rocky Mountains, we were just under 9,500 uh, feet in elevation. And then the Rocky Mountains towered above us another 5,000 feet. So, uh, you know, in perspective, that's about 8,000 feet higher than our own uh, Mount LeConte. And we were up there, and we got to witness all this, and it was it was absolutely amazing to witness God's beautiful creation. But, but the best part of this is yesterday I talked to Pastor Josh, and he said that at camp, we had to leave a little early, so we weren't there the very last day. But he said the last day of camp, three kids trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Amen? Isn't that good? And he said there was five or six more kids that they had to follow up with. Now, for a new church plant, that's huge because that means that they're going to be in contact with about eight or nine families that could potentially join this new church plant. So you continue to, to pray for Pastor Josh and pray for River Church. And we're going to go again really soon out there. Um, you know, one night I was just laying in bed at, at back at our Airbnb. I think it was about on Tuesday night. And I was just thinking about preaching this Sunday and and I, I knew that I wasn't going to have a lot of time to prepare this past week because we were just so busy. And so I, Pastor Anthony asked me a couple weeks ago, so I kind of knew the direction I was going in. I was just laying there in the bed thinking, and, and, and this thought just occurred to me. In this life, we are going to face a lot of mountains. And it, it's not the kind of mountains like the Rockies or the Smokies, but I'm talking about those seemingly impossible mountains circumstances that come into our life sometimes those those insurmountable challenges mountains that hinder our life mountains that hinder our walk with Jesus sometimes and and you know these mountains can take the form of sometimes financial uh, trouble problems sickness broken relationships emotional burdens or just maybe worrying about family you know that's one of the one of the greatest things and you know I could go on and on but listen you know what these mountains are in your life it's it's the thing that wakes you up at night and it's the thing that doesn't let you go back to sleep they're on your mind you're concerned about these mountains Jesus warned his disciples about these mountains he told them this he said in this world you will have trouble he said he said basically this is a godless culture that you're living in and, and it just seems to be getting worse and worse every day and he says you're gonna have difficulty you're gonna have great distress in this world if you follow me but Jesus said take heart for I have conquered the world amen isn't that good to know so listen how do we face these mountains when they come in our life parents how do we how do we handle when our kids go astray sometimes how do we respond to broken relationships in our families how do we deal with sickness and disease that just seem to always come our way you know, one of these mountains that Jesus' disciples faced was uh, the mountain of doubt. Uh, you know, this is one time is seen in Matthew 17. Jesus had healed a demon-possessed boy, and, and the disciples hadn't been able to heal him. And after it was, the event was over, they came to Jesus and said, Why can we not heal this little boy? Why could we not do it? And Jesus said, Because you have so little faith. He said, If you have faith just the size of a little mustard seed and and I got a I got a container of these mustard seeds and my goodness they're little you can't even hold them in your hand they're they're just they're, they're just very very tiny I mean even if I were to to put it on my finger there you you couldn't even see it it's so little and I believe Jesus took the smallest seed that the disciples knew about was aware of and he said listen you take just a little bit of faith you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and that mountain is going to move. He said, nothing will be impossible for you. Let's pray together real quick. Father, thank you, God, so much for this opportunity. God, I cannot stand up here and offer this church, the people here, God, anything. But, God, you can offer them everything. So, God, I just pray now that you'll just remove me 
just remove me from this message and God you just speak through me I just pray that your Holy Spirit will just lead and guide every word everything that's said God because we want you to get the honor and the glory if anything good comes out of this today be with the people here today that are that are facing mountains with a crowd this size there's many mountains represented in this room and God you know exactly what those mountains are and God you you want to help us through those mountains over those mountains you want to make those mountains move in our lives and God I pray today that we'd be open to your word and just say yes to Jesus and it's in his name I pray amen listen today you're going to hear two different stories you're going to hear about two different mountains two different results and and two ways that God has moved and and that God continues to move in these and and to set up this first story I want to go back to this verse and understand what Jesus was saying it's not the it's not the size of our faith and again you can't even see that it's not the size of our faith that has nothing to do with it but it's the it's the object of our faith you know faith can be misplaced here's what the world would have you believe that if you're sincere enough about what you believe that if your faith is big enough that it's strong enough in the end it's all gonna work out you're gonna be okay no matter what you believe you're gonna be okay that's what the world would have you believe but understand faith has very little to do about us and it has all to do about the object of our faith and that's the person of Jesus Christ that's what Jesus was trying to get across to the disciples to, in, in this story Paul said it this way to the church at Corinth he said Do you think I'm like the people of the world who say yes when they really mean no as surely as God is faithful our word to you does not waver between yes or no for Jesus Christ the Son of God does not waver between yes or no he is the one we preach to you as God's ultimate yes for all of God's promises are fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes Jesus Christ has come to fulfill all the promises of God and then here's where we play a part in this it says and through Christ only through Jesus Christ it says our amen or our yes ascends to God for his glory see it's only through Christ that we have that faith it's only through him it's where we it's where we place our faith and it's only through Jesus that we can be of any worth to God because he became sin for us so we could become the righteousness to God amen that's so good listen I want to tell you this uh, just start in this first story this first story involves me and my wife Laura and our oldest daughter Julia this happened about 12 or 13 years ago my daughter I was in bed one night around 10 o'clock and I'll, I'll never forget this conversation she calls me from from college and she was just starting I think her sophomore year first year in, or first second year in college she went with a lot of credits so it wasn't a full year but it was her sophomore year in college she called me and she says dad I need to talk and and this wasn't really abnormal we talked a lot and we had a little small talk you know and I asked her all the the dad questions how you doing how's your grades how's your money holding up have you checked oil in your car have you kicked the tires is everything okay you know do I need to come to Nashville tomorrow and help you out you know one of those one of those deals being a dad and after we got through with a small talk after all that was done she said dad I have to ask you a question I said okay what's the question she said do you really do you really believe that there is a literal place called hell and my bedroom was about as quiet as it is right now when she asked me that question because you see I realized that she knew that I believe that there was a place called hell after all I was her daddy of about at that time about 20 years I was her youth pastor growing up she had heard me preach about heaven and and also heard me preach about hell so I believe she knew where I stood so then I'm thinking why is Julia asking me this question and I kind of answered her this way Julia I, I, I do believe there's a hell Jesus talked a lot about heaven but he also talked a lot about hell it, it's a place of judgment it's a it's a place of outer darkness it's a place of of torment the Bible describes it as a place of great pain it says there the people there will be there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and, and and I said most of all it's a place of eternal separation from God 
and from all that is good. And it never ends. Something like that, I, you know, I just shared that with her. And after my mini sermon, I thought things are going to be okay now. Julia said these eight words. I don't know if I believe that anymore. I don't know if I believe that anymore. I don't know what it sounds like when your heart just drops, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure mine did that at that moment because this was my daughter, Julia, my firstborn. I remember when she surrendered her life to Christ. I remember how she served in our church for years, that she led Bible study. She was a part of our youth worship team. Uh, she even helped write a devotional for young girls, girls that were younger than her, and we had looked over that thing, and man, it was, it was solid based on the Word of God. And I'd seen God produce fruit in her life, and, and now she's asking me this question, and she's telling me that she doesn't really believe that anymore. And I just asked her, simply asked her, I said, Julia, what has changed your way of thinking? What, what has changed in your life? And she said, well, Dad, I've been reading a book, and I've been hanging out with some people, listening to them. And she said, Dad, there was this speaker that came to, to our campus. And, man, you know him because you used to, you used to show some of his videos in, at, at, at youth group, you, at youth night. You would show his videos. And I'm like, who is this guy? You know, and I asked her, and she told me the guy's name. And, and then she went on to tell me that he was, he was teaching that there's really not a place called hell. And that in the end, love is going to win, and we're all going to be okay. And this is just totally, this guy had taken a 180 degree from what he used to teach because I had used his videos, I had read some of his books, and all of a sudden, he, he's, he, he's just teaching these false truths about God's Word. And not only is he doing that, but, but listen, it's personal now because it's, a, it's, a, it's affecting my little girl. It's affecting my daughter. And we talked a little bit, and... And I remember this is what I told you, Julia, at the end of the conversation. I said, Julia, you know Jesus, right? She said, yeah, Dad, I do. I said, I want you to search his word. I want you to look in the Bible. Put that book down. I want you to look in the Bible to see what God says about heaven, what God says about hell. I want you to seek God in this matter. And listen, I'll be praying for you. And here's one more thing I want you to do, Julia. <laughs> Send me that book. <laughs> I want to read this book that you're reading. And she did. She sent it to me. But, you know, I remember it as I laid there in bed, I went through, man, I went through so many emotions at first, and I was just shocked. I could not believe this. It was just, and, and then I got real angry. I mean, I got mad. I wanted to, I wanted to go, go and hop on a plane and find this guy. I had no idea where he lived, but I just wanted to go find him. And, and then there was this, just this fear that came over me. I mean, it's just the fear that, is my daughter just going to continue to drift? And, and, and then... And then just, just really a deep sadness because she had been exposed to some things and, and that she was leaning this way. And, it was just, and that's just to name a few of my emotions. And I remember, I remember just asking God, God, why is this happening? How, how is this happening? I, I can't understand. Why, why am I feeling the weight of this huge mountain on me now? And, and so I just, I just remember started, started praying. And somewhere during that prayer... I just realized that Julia's disbelief in a place called hell, which is ultimately disbelief in God's word, was not my mountain, but it was hers. That wasn't my mountain, it was hers. I think like the disciples, though, my mountain, because of my wor worry, because of my questioning, because of my doubt, that was my mountain. I was sitting there going, God, are you going to do anything about this? Why did you let this happen? So, so that was my mountain because here's a dad. I wanted to fix this thing. I wanted to fix it. I wanted to hop in my car at 11 o'clock at night and just drive, drive to Nashville, go to Julia's, Julia's apartment, and I wanted to just to see her. I wanted to maybe hug her, maybe just shake her a little bit and say, listen, wake up because you know this is not true. These, these false teachings are not true. And as I lay there in bed, listen, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 immediately came to my mind. And I'm going to put this up here, but, but oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that, put that one up. But, but I want to stop right here and just say this about, about God's Word. It's important for us 
to know God's word. It's important for us to have his word in us because, listen, that's where our faith comes from. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is about Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. So that's where our faith starts. So it's so important that we know the Word. If I hadn't known Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it would, God would not have brought it to my mind at that time. Because listen, if we don't know the Word, if we don't have it hidden in our hearts, we always try to handle things our ways, and we just mess things up a lot. We must know and live by God's Word by his design for our life, walking in obedience to his word, we have to know God's word. And the verse says this that God brought to my mind. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. God spoke to me. The Holy Spirit revealed to me that this is something that I could not fix. This was something that was out of my control. I had to surrender this totally and fully to God. Now, we had, we had dedicated our children to God when they were younger, but now the real test came because Julia is, is 200 miles away, and I can't be there every minute of every day, and I can't be in on every conversation that she's having. I can't screen every book she's reading. So I realized that I had to put my trust and my full trust with all my heart. I had to just trust God in this situation. And I know sometimes when you face these mountains, people say that we just got to trust God. Well, listen, that's the best advice anybody can give you if you will follow it. And you not only trust Him with all your heart, you got to quit trying to figure out yourself. And you got to submit to Him these things. You got to say, God, here they are. I'm incapable of doing much about this. I can share your word, I can share your truth. But God, you're able to fix this thing, and I'm not. Another passage of Scripture came to my mind right after that, and it was this one. Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. It was like God's way of saying, listen, listen, you pointed Julia to Jesus. Now, were Laura and I perfect parents? Absolutely not. Did we mess up? Yes, we did. And sometimes I, I, I think back and I think, did I spend more time with other kids in my youth group than I did my own daughter? And and, and, and I especially did it this time. And I, I had that guilt start to come back in, but I said, I've got to submit that to Jesus. I've got to give it to him. I can't, I can't do this. But the Bible says, direct your children on to the right path, and when they're older, they will not leave it. Listen, that's a promise of God right there. And parents, I want to just say a quick word. Listen, you have, if your kids are 12 and under, you're going to have the most influence that you will ever have in their life right now. That number 30 years ago was a lot higher. It was in the upper teens. But as every, every year passes, that number declines a little more and more and more because of things called social media, uh, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, all these things that influence our kids on a daily basis. And, and it, it starts to influence them, and, and it starts to make a bigger impact on their life than than even you can make. And I know some of you are sitting there thinking, yeah, but we got a great children's uh, program here at Connect Church, which we do. But understand this. If you take up all the time that Erin has and her team has with your kids, and you even throw Bible school in there, and you don't miss a Sunday, it's just a little over two days of training. It's over a, a, just a little over two days a year and pouring Jesus into them. You've... You were with them every day. I'm going to throw some stats at you. And this was four years ago. I couldn't find any current ones. This was four years ago, because so I'm sure the numbers have gotten worse. Out of 100 out of 100% of kids that grew up in church, by the time they're 17, only 69% of them will remain in the church. By the time they're 18, only 58% remain in the church. We've almost lost half of them by the time they're 18. By age 19, only 40% will remain in the church. And by the time they're age 20, one in three come to church. That's about 33%. And that's four-year ago survey. I know that number's not gotten any better. Listen, parents, listen, grandparents, we need to understand that this is a promise from God, that we have to direct and help and point our children to Jesus to direct them on to that right path. And listen, they may, they may go off that path, some, 
But the Bible says when they're older, they're not going to leave it. They're going to get back on it. Other verses that God <clears throat> had given to me and, and some to Laura, it was this one in Psalm 1611. You make known the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. And, and, and all of these, these themes, these, these path themes were just being poured out on me. And then in Ecclesiastes, we're assured that there's a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens. And so Laura and I just started praying. We started praying. We started submitting our daughter and this mountain to Jesus. We started lifting it up to prayer and, and, and prayer to God. And, and, and one of our prayers was this. It was, it was God put people in Julia's path to help her to see the truth. We're 200 miles away. She needs somebody there. She needs somebody there that is local that can help her. And, and, you know, and I think some of her roommates that she was with was kind of pointing. She was living with them, and they were kind of off on this other thing as well. And, and, and you know, so we started praying. Uh, God, we know that you started a good work in my daughter's life, and, and we want her back on that path again. We want you to complete that work. Your word says you will. And we started praying these things. And then a few months, maybe, maybe even a year, I can't remember the exact time, we noticed things started to change. As Laura would have conversations with Julia and I would have conversations with her, she started talking about a Bible study and a church that she had found. We saw the, the goodness of God be evident in her life again. Uh, she went on to graduate a, a couple of years later, and, and we just saw her faith continue to grow after she graduated. She broke my heart and said, I'm going to stay in Nashville. I said, okay. It's all right, I guess. Nashville's not that far away. Uh, but she lived in Nashville. And then about two and a half years after that, she started dating a young man who grew to love her. And about two and a half years later, they were married. And this is our little family now. This is Now, my other daughter's not in there, but she's, she's up in Chicago. But this is our family. This is my son-in-law, Thomas. And, 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 you know, God seemed to move that mountain in our life. But I just want to share, he just didn't do it my way. He did it his way, and God's way is always better than our, our ways, right? Higher and greater. And, and so four years after Julia and Thomas were married, they, they dated for two and a half years. So this is like six and a half years later. Thomas and I were driving one day. They were in town. We were driving to the hardware store. And, and this, this time of Julia's life just kind of came to my mind. And I knew they had been friends for a while before they started dating, good friends, hanging out with, with each other. And I said, Thomas, do you remember a time in Julia's life, maybe her sophomore year, that she kind of drifted away from the truth of God's word, that some people kind of misled her, and there was this speaker that came to campus. Does, does any of this ring a bell with you? And this is what my son-in-law said. He said, oh, yeah, I was there during that time. He said, I saw Julia making bad choices and bad decisions. I saw her listening to, to people that she shouldn't listen to. I was, I was at that seminar. I remember that guy coming to campus, and it just kind of messed with her, messed her up. And he said, every opportunity I got, I would try to pour into her. I would invite her to Bible study. I would invite her to church because it just really became a burden to me to help Julia. And as I sat there, we were driving down the road. Man, I was tearing up. And this verse just came to my mind again. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. You see, Laura and I were praying for God to put people into Julia's path that would help lead her back to the truth, that would help lead her back to Jesus and God. And God went one step further than that. He said, I'm not only going to put somebody in her life, I'm going to put her future husband in her life. He did immeasurably more than we could have ever asked or thought. It was just an amazing thing. And, and, and now we have, back up here, we have this little guy. Oh, my goodness. Listen, if it wasn't for you guys, I'd be in Nashville right now holding him. I mean, I love that kid. He's, he's, he's just awesome. Um, but understand, understand this. 
God moved that mountain in Julia's life. And to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen? But let me ask you this question. In his sovereignty, what if God chooses not to move that mountain? What then? We're getting ready to show a video. Team in the back, if you'll get that ready. This is a video of a friend of mine, Cliff Ock. Cliff's here today. And Cliff shared his story with me in detail a few weeks ago. And I said, man, Cliff, people need to hear your story. So this is Cliff's story. This is the other story you're going to hear today about mountains and people's life. Y'all go ahead and roll that video. My name is Cliff Ott, and I have a few passions. My passions are karate. I love martial arts. I've been involved in it since 1978. I like teaching, and I like riding my tractor. The first moment I knew something was wrong when I was actually at a karate tournament with my students, and I had a pain that I couldn't describe, and I had to go sit down. My wife was with me and we decided, even at the karate tournament on the bleachers, that we needed to go see a doctor about it. I got a call from the nurse and she told me my PSA levels were over 140. It should have been four or five or something under that. It was a hard hitting moment. The moment that scared me the most is when I went to the urologist and did a normal checkup that he does to test for these things and looked at me and says, yep, you've got cancer. And then sat me down with my wife and told the story of what was happening and the tests that I would have to take what took me back the most was the look uh, in my wife's eyes because she's my best friend. And she saw the depth of it actually before I did. It didn't take any words uh, for Fela, my wife, to say a word. I just saw her heart sink. That's what I saw. My thought on being diagnosed with cancer was uncertainty. That was my biggest thought. My mind went immediately to my wife and kids and how they were going to go through this as well and suffer the same thing basically I would except for the pain. There was a pivotal moment when I was in my study googling stage four prostate cancer. Basically the information I received over the internet was that I had five years to live. That was the average. And it was that time that there was a pivot in my thought process. I'd been saved since I was age 23. I knew Christ, I knew his word, and I believe that through everything that's happened prior to has prepared me for that moment. There's sometimes that I gave my problems to God and took them back. This one, I made a decision. I was determined to give my problem, my illness to Christ and not take it back. And when I was sincere about that and meant it, uh, this peace just came over me and I didn't worry about it anymore didn't mean that I wasn't going to go through it it meant that I had this, this inner peace that I cannot explain very impressed with my oncologist but ultimately I can't depend on him I've got to depend on the one who created me uh, and I think the whole idea behind uh, depending on God is knowing where you're at. 
uh, with a holy and righteous God. There's a Bible verse that comes to my mind, is Psalm 7118, that God's really drawn me to. And it basically says that when I'm old and gray-headed, oh God, forsake me not until I've shown thy strength unto this generation and thy power unto ev to everyone that is to come. And my eyes really went to that one. And I'm looking forward to the next step. I'm looking forward to the next chapter because like I said, it, it hasn't been written yet. And I'm just expecting big things from God and how he's gonna use me. Amen. Thank you, Cliff, for sharing that. And, and I want to say again, you know, no matter if God moves the mountain or if he chooses not to, and I think you can hear in Cliff's testimony, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. I want to give you just four real quick takeaways. Because I know you're facing some mountains here. There was a couple in our prayer request time today. People facing cancer. Man, Cliff would be a great resource to talk with, to pray with. He'll pray for you. I promise he will. Four quick takeaways. What do I do when facing a mountain? The first thing is this. You stand on God's promises. His divine power has given us everything we need to live a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his glorious and goodness. Through these things, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them we may participate in the divine nature, escaping the corruption of the world and its evil desires. Listen, when you stand on the promises of God and you live by those promises, you participate in the divine nature of Jesus Christ. The next one is this. You declare God's greatness. No matter where you're at on that mountain, you declare God's greatness. The Bible says in Psalms, I will exalt you, my king. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you. I will extol your name. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They tell of the power of your awesome works. I will proclaim your great deeds. We will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Listen, do your neighbors know where you stand with Jesus? Do your co-workers, do your classmates, do your family members, do your friends know? Have you told them about God's mighty acts and his awesome works and his glorious kingdom? See, we do this so they will know this. Verse 13 in there says... We want them to know that God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures through all generations and that he is trustworthy in all that he promises and he is faithful in all that he does. Jesus says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can tell this mountain to move and it'll move. You know, Laura got a, a Christian t-shirt for her birthday and I typically, typically don't go for those a lot of times. But this one said this and I absolutely loved it. Because most of the time we spend a lot of time telling God about our mountains. And he already knows. This shirt simply said this. Tell your mountain about your God. Tell your mountain about your God. Hey, doubt, let me tell you about my Jesus. Hey, fear, my God walks before me, walks beside me, and his mercy and goodness follow me all the day of my life. Hey, hey, disease, hey, sickness, you're going to have to take a back seat to God and his glory in my life because my life is all about him. No matter, what, no matter where I go or what I do, I'm going to see his goodness. We sang that song this morning, and I love it. Now listen, and I think if you're a follower of Jesus, we have to agree, uh, to agree that God has shown us his goodness. He has shown us his grace and his mercy at the cross of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't have to do one thing more to prove his love for us. Not one thing more. God has done enough because Jesus is enough in any situation. So we declare that to the world. We declare that to our mountains. Then the third thing is just simply this. We pray God's word. We, we pray God's word. The Bible says the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. 
Our lives as followers of Jesus should be saturated with the Word of God. So it makes sense that our prayer, prayer life should be filled with God's Word as well. Jesus prayed the Word. The early church in Acts prayed the Word. Paul prayed the Word. God's Word is active. It's powerful. And with faith, we should pray, pray His Word in our lives and over our mountains. And the last thing is just simply this. We need to live within God's design. The Bible says many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Listen, there's purpose in our mountains. God's desire is for those purposes to prevail in the impossible, in the trials of our life. God wants to use these mountains to, to grow our faith. God wants to use these mountains to demonstrate His power and His might. He wants to use these mountains for us to bring Him honor and glory, to make us and mold us like Jesus, to become like Jesus. And if God chooses to move that mountain, it'll move. To God be the glory. But in His sovereignty, if He allows that mountain to remain, we, just like Cliff, have to conclude, to God be the glory. Let me ask you this. What mountains are you facing today? What mountains are you facing today? You know those mountains. You know what they are. I think the best thing that has ever happened to the people in this room that know Jesus is the fact that Jesus came down to this earth and he died for them and one day they realized that and they surrendered their life to Jesus. Jesus forgave them of their sins and he saved them. And listen, we don't have to face those mountains alone. Amen, church? We do not have to face those mountains alone. That song we sang, our sins are forgiven, our future is heaven. We praise God for what he has done. We praise God for what he's done. Let's pray together. Father, I just, uh, God, I come before you today and I just pray right now that people would be searching their hearts. I pray right now, God, that there may be people here in this church service that they're facing mountains and they don't know Jesus. They don't know the hope that they can have in Him. They don't know the peace that He can bring, even in impossible situations. They don't know the future that they have in heaven. God, I pray that you would touch their hearts right now, convict them of their sins, and prepare them, God, to surrender to you. Listen, if, if, if you're here in this place today, and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't know if you were to die today, if heaven would be your home. Listen, there's good news today. Jesus wants to save you. He wants to give you assurance of your salvation. He wants to give you a hope, the hope of heaven, and the hope of him being with you right now in the midst of maybe a mountain you're going through. Listen, if you're here today and you have never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit's been, been speaking to your heart today, and you need to surrender your life to Jesus, you need to trust Jesus today. If that's you today, if that's you today, will you simply just bow your head and pray this prayer with me? Listen. And this is not a magical prayer. It's not a, it's not a magical words. But, but when you pray this prayer from your heart to the heart of God, His Word teaches us, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're here today and you need Jesus, just pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I realize, God, that, that I'm a sinner. And I realize, God, that that sin separates me from you. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and save me. I surrender my life to you today. Thank you, Jesus, for, for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for rising again. And God, because... 
because Jesus, because you have life, I now can have eternal life and rest in you. Listen, with nobody looking around, our team on stage is not even looking. Listen, if you prayed that prayer today, I want to rejoice with you. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to come to you. I won't embarrass you. I would never do that. But if you prayed that prayer today, would you just look up at me? I just want to see your eyes for a minute. I'm over on my far right, your far left. If, if you prayed that prayer today, would you just look up at me for just a minute? Anybody over here? Anybody in this center section? Would you just look up at me and, and say, I prayed to trust Jesus today as my Lord and Savior. I'm looking around, looking around the room. Just look up at me, make eye contact with me, and then you can look back down. Anybody in this other middle section, right in front of the soundboard, that section, anybody here? I see you. I see your eyes. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Just look up at me and say, I trusted Jesus today. I need Jesus in my life today to face this. Anybody? Anybody over here on my far left, the far right, anybody just look up at me and just say, I trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior today. Anybody anywhere? Amen. For that one person that I saw, and there may have been more because it's a little dark in here and a lot of people. Listen, if you prayed to trust Jesus today, would you just look up at the screen? And, and there's a number on the screen. And will you just text your name to that number? That goes to Pastor Anthony's desk. And he would just love to call you and to, to pray with you, to follow up with you, and talk to you about the decision you made today to follow Jesus, to trust Christ as your Savior. Another option is stop by our Next Steps tent. It's right outside in the lobby. You just want to stop by there real quick, and, and there'll be people there that can, can help you and pray with you, and we would love to give you a new Bible today. Just stop by there and see them, and they will, they will love on you and take care of you today. Would everybody just look up at me for just a minute? We're getting ready to sing this song, and, and what I've done, and and I don't know if this will help you or not, but I know there's some, I know there's people facing some mountains today. And I've taken some of these little mustard seeds and I put them in three trays right here. Again, nothing magic. They won't grow bean stalks or anything like that. But if you want to come and get one of those, it's just a reminder that this is all the faith I have to have, but if I put it in Jesus... It can move mountains. Maybe you just want to pray for your mountain today. My wife, Laura, has this necklace, and she wears it often, and it's a mustard seed embedded in that glass right there. She just wears it as a reminder of it's not about my faith, but it's about who I put it in. So as we stand and sing this song, maybe you want to come down here and just submit, just give your mountain to God today. Just give it to Him. Let.
Father, we just thank you, God, for what you've done in our lives. God, what you continue to do. And God, as we just submit our lives to you, God, we pray that you would just continue to have your hand on Connect Church. Thank you, God, for those that place their faith and trust in you today. And God, I just pray for all the mountains in this room, God, today. Pray, God, that you would just carry us over them, through them, or just make them go away all together, God. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Pastor Dominic, you come and close us out. Make some announcements today. All right, everybody. Hey, thank you so much for being here. You can be seated for just a moment. Uh, we want to thank you. Hey, can we give it up for, for Pastor David bringing such a great word? Uh, I've gotten multiple text messages from people who are watching online going, man, that's great. That was awesome. And, uh, man, I'm just crying in my living room. And so uh, the Lord, uh, man, used Pastor David this morning and, uh, and encourage him that as well when you see him. Hey, I want to let you know of a couple things that are going on. One, oh, gosh, I will get in so much trouble. Uh, generosity team, please come forward. I will forget that in a second. Generosity team, please come forward. Uh, if you will uh, get in position. We actually have a cool recap video. You guys have been hearing about Denver. We actually uh, made a cool recap video. One of our students did that. Uh, you guys can watch that here on the screen. again so much for joining us for an awesome morning of worship. Uh, if you made a decision for Christ today, we want to know about it. Up on the screen, you'll see a phone number. You can text your first name to that number. Somebody from our team is going to reach out to you this week. We just want to come alongside of you as you take your next steps in your walk with the Lord. Kelsey, that Denver recap video. Awesome. We just had an incredible week in Denver, and we have said this time and time again, but online audience, your generosity matters. And we are able to do things like VBS and Denver mission trips and Love Week because of you and your generosity. So if you are looking for a way to give today, there's three different ways you can do that. You can go online, you can give by text or by mail. Just again, thank you so much. Um, we couldn't do what we do without you. So thank you for your prayers and your time and just for joining us every Sunday. Absolutely, for sure. Connect Church online audience, we love you guys. We're praying over you guys this week. Until next Sunday, we hope you have an awesome week. You are sent. 